Hello, David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. This is a bit of a special video for me because um, I was asked by AJB to do a series of questions asked by the members and Higgins. First of all, if you're asking yourself, what is AJB? It's absolutely James Bond. To me, it is absolutely my favorite James Bond fan forum. I've been there for well before the Bond experience even existed uh, in my infant stage, if you will. And it's just a good group of people over there. Yeah, we, we get into our little riffs and discussions and politics every now and then, but who doesn't? But it tends to shy away from that. It's usually a very cohesive group, and they uh, got together. They're doing a series of interviews. The first one with, uh, was with Calvin Dyson. It was really entertaining. And we figured that this would be an appropriate way to do it because I'm the video guy. So why would I write things down when I could just give you a video answering your questions? So, by the way, thank you, Barbell. Um, uh, that's not that Barbell. It's just it's very nice gentleman uh, asking me to do this and putting these questions together. And by the way, I uh, will put the link for AJB down below. Um, but if you need to go there, if you want to go there, uh, we'll put it down there below. It's a fantastic site. And we're off to the races. By the way, these uh, series of questions uh, could also be used as a sleep aid. If you want to get to sleep at night, you need to get a little bit bored. Maybe you want to watch this. All right. Enough self-deprecating humor. What sparked your interest in James Bond? This reads like a psychiatrist's dream. Um, I should be laying on the couch right now. So I had a father who was a very successful entrepreneur, and uh, but very busy. He was on the road a lot. He was focusing on his business. So he didn't have a ton of time to throw a baseball in the backyard. He did have time, though, and I remember this very specifically to, uh, to ask his son David, uh, when there was a James Bond film on TV, to come and watch it with him. So I'm pretty sure I'm trying to capture daddy moments. So this was an expensive way to try to do that. I'm pretty sure therapy would have been cheaper, but there it is. Uh, how do you see the future of the franchise taking in the Me Too movement, and should Eon be heading for more outlandish or grittier? That's a lot of stuff in there. Um, yeah, taking in the Me Too movement, I know there's been a lot of conversation around this. Uh, I don't want to make any assumptions right now of what's going to be in the film or how it's going to be in the film. There's enough vlogs and blogs out there. I've even done some of them. Uh, so I'm not going to take up the time to do that here. But I will say this, if they're using the Me Too movement as plot points or to act as relevancy, I think it's a mistake. I just do. Um, I, I feel like James Bond, 007, they go together, number one. Number two, uh, he is a spy and assassin. And spy and assassins aren't supposed to be considerate. They're not supposed to be overly aware. In fact, he uses his sexuality for part of his job. I mean, he's got to woo and entice people and his charm to do that. So he should really be the last person uh, to be involved in all of these uh, types of Me Too aspects. It's just me. Um, should the people around him be involved with that? Fine, but not so it makes him look like a buffoon, if that makes sense. And I do think that Bond 26, after this one, I think they may go for a little bit more humor. I think that they'll take a look at the world and say, you know, something, the world needs a good chuckle, a good laugh. I hope it's not like, you know, pour wine over the guy double taking pigeon humor. But I do think there'll be a little bit more wry comebacks, pithiness, etc. Um, but I like the grittiness. I mean, I like I like quantum. You know, I, I think the grittiness of you know seeing an assassin kill somebody and then you know being a lover boy in the next scene. There's just something escapism about that. Uh, what do you think are the quintessential aspects of the Bond character that we can take forward from Bond 25 onwards, and so we don't lose the essence of James Bond? That's a good one because everybody's talking about the essence of James Bond slash 007 uh, losing some of its aspects, and I hope they don't. Um, I don't want him to lose his Britishness, uh, his smugness, his ability to kick ass, his arrogance, his being capable to do anything, his expertise in just about everything. I don't want him to lose any of that. I don't want him to lose the fact that um, if you've ever seen the, the movie Red Sparrow, they train their agents to act a certain way, to, again, use their sensuality to do that. Bond should do the same. 
uh, in any environment that we're in, uh, in any society that we're in. And, you know, if it's on his downtime, that might be something else. But when he's James Bond 007, he is a spy, assassin, Majesty's Secret Service. Boom. He's not Superman. He's not Clark Kent. He doesn't have to do the Boy Scout thing. Is that the boy? I don't know if that's a Boy Scout thing. Uh, any thoughts on possible future Bond actors? I'm still in the Henry Cavill. 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 Kibbles and Bits. Cavill camp. Um, I, I just am. I, I, I think he would be, he's got the, the physicality to do the Bond thing. He's got the humor. I, I think he would be good, but I'm sure there's some unknown guy out there that's going to do it. Hashtag Calvin Dyson. Um, do you think all the fun is going out of the films now? Do you think we'll get more humor? Kind of like the, the other one. I don't think the fun has gone out. I think the, the third part of Spectre, a lot of the fun went out. It got, got a little wonky there for a moment, but I think we can capture it back. Um, I'm hoping Carrie brings, look, look at me, Carrie. Yeah, we're first name, not. Uh, Carrie Fukunaga brings something to the table with that, but we'll have to see. Would you be open to seeing any of the many James Bond continuation novels used more overtly in future James Bond films? I, I don't think I would like to see any of them turned into a film, but I think there are certain really creative things that happen in some of those novels that it wouldn't be bad to um, add in there. Um, you know, we're Bond fans, so we're going to call out the writers and go, you robbed that from, you know, rigor mortis. And, you know, but it would be kind of fun to do that. Uh, David, which film first got you interested in Bond clothing? That's a good question. So I would say I was a very young executive in my early 30s when Tomorrow Never Dies, I was just getting back into James Bond. And before clothing, it was actually props. I know, me of all people, but I do love props. And um, I remember getting the Ericsson phone screen used and I remember getting uh, the eyeglasses screen used and I was like, oh my gosh, because I used to collect screen used um, props uh, from all different types of movies. But then I was like, you know, Pierce Brosnan was the template. You know, he was so calm, cool, the way he moved, everything. And I said, look at, look at that. That's what a suit should look like. That's what a tie should look like. That's how somebody, you know, moves and, and connects and, and dresses. And so I started to like rob little things from that, you know, because I was that typical sack suit guy wearing suits and clothing really badly. Probably still do. But I took that as a pattern. So Tomorrow Never Dies sparked it. And then I got that Tomorrow Never Dies Omega watch, the one with the gadgets. And then we were off to the races. By the time uh, The World Is Not Enough came into play, I was full on addict. Like today. Which is your favorite ensemble from any of the Bond films? I would have to go with... Uh, the Casino Royale airport outfit. And it's a couple reasons. First of all, the jacket, the lambskin jacket is so soft, so amazing. Um, love that I've got that connection to the movie, that, that piece, that artifact, if you will, from the movie. But the other thing is, I remember watching it in the theater. That scene was just so badass. And it was that new Bond that could run through walls and, and do action-oriented things and the smugness he had when the terrorist blows up. All of those things put together just make it an ensemble. I don't wear it that much, but it is just, I think it's one of my favorites. It even beats like the Goldfinger three-piece suit, which I know is iconic. Uh, which film do you consider has the best Bond clothing? Uh, I'm going to an answer this two ways. I'm going to drive everybody crazy. So I do think for, boy, I'm sitting in the right place. For practicality's sake, Quantum of Solace, kind of eh, over here, um, has the best outfits that everybody can wear. I like the way the Tom Ford suits wear. I like uh, the shoes. I like the casual clothing. I like the jackets. I like practically everything that Bond wears in that movie. I mean, the aviator sunglasses, unbelievable. But I would have to say that probably Goldfinger has these iconic looks, whether it was the golfing outfit or the three-piece suit or what he wears on the airplane or, yes, the towel and onesie um, that just has these indelible moments that I do think the, uh, the, the best and most incredible pieces are from there. Are there any pieces you've bought but wouldn't wear? What are you, trying to get me in trouble? Uh, you know something? I believe it or not, and I know I just did a video where I'm actually wearing and reviewing the toweling onesie from all of our brand. 
I don't buy anything unless I'm going to wear it. Um, I know I'm surrounded by display of clothing, but it's because I'm not wearing these clothes right now. Uh, I am a firm believer that I'm not going to buy something because Daniel Craig wears it. I'm not going to buy something because James Bond wears it unless I'm going to wear it. And, and it's true. And there have been some pieces that I wouldn't buy just because I looked at it and it said, I'm not going to wear that piece. It's, it's, it's a little too ridiculous. So honestly, I don't own anything. If you ask me, would I wear the um, toweling onesie in public? I don't know. It would have to be really the right situation. It would have to involve a little bit of alcohol and um, maybe the right setting. Yeah, so I'll just stop there. Uh, to what extent do you think that Bond's clothing is realistic? <laughs> Are there any pieces you think go too far to, or miss the mark? Um, I, I'm going to agree with Matt Spazer. I think some of the suits from Spectre and some of the suits from Skyfall were a little too tight. Um, you know, I think they used to be more unrealistic. You know, Bond showing up to a casino where everybody else is in shorts and a t-shirt and he's wearing a, a, a like it's a, a tuxedo. It's really out of place. Bond in Quantum of Solace wearing a suit on the airplane in full jacket, that missed the mark. I mean, even if you're in a suit, I've worn a suit on an airplane, even in first class, they take your jacket for you. You're not wearing it. Now, if you get up and go to the bar, the sky bar, do you put the jacket back on? Uh, I don't think so. So I, the whole idea of Bond being overly dressed in an underdressed situation, I think in general, misses the mark. I do think that um, when you see Bond wear like the Moroccan jacket from Spectre and Morocco is really hot and they look like they're sweating. I don't know why he would put a suede jacket on. Uh, in a desert type situation. So those types of things, when it doesn't hit the environment or the measurement, I'm like, why? You know, wearing a Harrington in the desert. Why? I mean, it looks great. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know if it's the most practical thing. Can you chat to my wife, please, and let her know that my collecting habit could be so much worse? Boy, you're talking to the right person. All right, go get your wife. Seriously, just pause the video and go get your wife. And, and I'll wait. Okay, she here? All right, I don't know her name, so here we go. <clears throat> hey, hey, how you doing? This is David Zaritsky, I hope you're doing well. Yeah, kind of the guy that, um, you know, kind of puts reviews up there so your husband goes and buys stuff. My apologies, but take a look around your husband's collection and take a look at just what's behind me. This is about a tenth of what my collection is, just what you can see. There's issues. I mean, clearly, your husband, a package shows up every now and then. I have multiple packages a day. Um, now, I don't spend me on my means, but neither does your husband. I mean, he takes care of you. You go on vacations. You went to that restaurant the other day, your favorite restaurant, and he got you that really nice gift over the holidays. Come on. Your husband's a good guy. You're not lacking for anything. Sure, he treats himself out now and then, but doesn't he deserve it? I'm just saying. Anyway, I hope you're doing well. Please forgive me. And he's not an idiot. Are you back? I hope that worked. I don't know if it worked or not. I hope it worked. Is there really, uh, is there any really out of his normal style, like the kit in On a Magic Secret Service or the One Piece and Goldfinger you'd like to see Bond wear? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Do you want him to wear anything out of it? No. I want this to really fit his style. It is so well known that Daniel Craig and practicing the pronunciation, uh, is, is incredibly influential in his clothing, even to the point of almost co-designing, should we say? So it's one of these things that I'm hoping he puts himself and uh, Sudarat, the costume designer, puts him in appropriate things. What's the best outfit any of the women uh, in the films? I would say uh, Vesper's purple dress. And I'm going to say something really misogynistic because it fits in all the right places. There you go. Okay, you've got the sound bite. Go for it. Uh, hi, David. Like myself, I think Daniel Craig's arrival into the Bond role helped pique your interest in Bond clothing and memorabilia. Do you think once Daniel Craig has left the role, you will still collect and emulate Bond's wardrobe with as much vigor? Yes, because he didn't spark my interest. It was actually Pierce Brosnan. A lot of people think that because um, my YouTube 
really came into being uh, during the Craig era. So everybody thinks, oh, he, he must love you know, the Daniel Craig style. I do really like it a lot, but uh, if it's somebody else, I'm still going to follow. It's Bond, and I'm hoping that they keep with the brands and the looks and the connection points that make Bond, Bond, and 007 together. All right, quick fire questions. Uh, Bond outfits, formal or casual? Uh, uh, I do like the casual ones just because I can wear them every day. Quick fire question number two, your favorite Bond film for wearable outfits? Still Quan of Solace. Sorry about the repeat. Uh, <laughs> now, words of wisdom from Higgins. These are questions from Higgins. Don't call him Higgy, baby. Oh, no, no, no. He gets upset about that. He'll sick his Dobermans on you. Did you ever regret these, the pictures showing you in the office with that Goldfinger suit on? Yeah, though. I, so there's a picture of me with a Goldfinger suit on. Yeah, and I look big. I, I was, I, I don't know if I, how overweight I was, but I, I hadn't started P90X. I hadn't really started working out. And I showed it to people to say, the, the Bond 25 fitness journey is real. Like you can start at like, you know, ground zero and work your way up to the stratosphere. So um, I'm not there yet, but you know, showing that is, I put it out there proudly that I have evolved over time. Now, it had gone backwards if that was me today, and, you know, then, yeah, maybe I'd hide it a little bit. Uh, how is your, what is your modus operandi, or oper operandum? When uh, a, pops up a new pic of Daniel Craig on the set wearing an unknown pair of sunglasses, polo shirts, etc., etc., or is the reply, I call Simon? <laughs> What's Daniel wearing? Um, yeah, it's usually I just text Simon and say, hey, did you see the, uh, the sunglasses, did you recognize them? And, and by then, you know, he's, he's had a few minutes and he's, he's observed them. I, I very rarely, rarely identify something anymore. There are so many people out there in this hobby. This hobby's become so uh, robust that I, I usually hear from other people before I wake up in the morning that, hey, this, this is this, or sometimes the brand. Uh, will say something. So it's nice. I mean, I, I don't have to do too much work. And I have to say something too. The, the whole thing of, I, I, I read this all the time on forums or on Instagram, someone going, I identified it first, first, I'm first, 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 who cares? Seriously, I just, great, you're first. Okay. But I like just getting this stuff. I don't need to be first. Anyway, boy, did I go off on a tangent. We know that dear Danielle, shh, you'll wake her. No, she, she's awake all the time. You, we know that dear Danielle is very supportive for your hobby, but there must have been certainly some David really moments. Huh. Yeah, there, there, it's not that there's one, and it's not that there's multiple. She's, she's actually unbelievably supportive of everything, the vacations, the locations, the events, the, the purchases, this, the Bond experience, everything. She's super cool. And I've involved her, so she's an integrated part of it now. But I would say that um, just all of a sudden, if packages start showing up and she sees the Instagrams now and she can correlate the packages to the Instagram, it's like, oh, he's going to get those sunglasses. Oh, he's going to get those shoes. Oh, oh, oh. And it's not like, oh my gosh, he's sending us to the poor house because that's not our situation. It's more like just <laughs> the constant, you know, it's like ding dong, UPS, ding dong, EMS, ding dong, FedEx. So I think that's what it is. Uh, and this has happened countless times with uh, Mrs. Higgins. My, my, my apologies to Mrs. Higgins, who I've met, sweet woman. They're very patient, our significant others. Rolex or Omega, Omega and why? My preference to wear is Omega. And I mostly have Omegas, but I have a really great Rolex, which Danielle adopted because I wasn't wearing it enough. So I don't tend to wear the Rolex. I tend to wear my Omega and I tend to wear my Planet Ocean. So preference to wear, I would say my Omegas, but there's something bond connected to Rolex that you just can't deny. All right. Have you done any topics in your vlog when you later said, no, I just, I can't, I, I can't, I can't broadcast that. I do have one, and it was interesting. It was a video that I filmed long ago when I was with James Bond Lifestyle, 
and it was a video where I actually went kind of to a gun show, a uh, little bit undercover, so to speak, but uh, it was lots of paraphernalia, memorabilia that I thought, uh, you know, it's just, it's going to get people on both sides talking back and forth, and I thought, no, nah, you know something, it's a throwback video anyway. It was shot very poorly, so I'm not even going to put it up there. Like, we need another interesting thing to talk about. What's the most expensive Bond item you've ever bought? So if I don't count my Aston Martin, I would say that it's the Omega watch from Spectre. The limited edition one that is the gadget from Spectre. That was uh, pretty expensive, but let, let's say it's the Aston Martin. What's the best bargain Bond item you've ever bought? Wow, that's, uh, I didn't even thought about that. Probably the, oh, no, I do know. The best Bond bargain item is my Tom Ford Skyfall tuxedo. And you're going to be like, come on, David, that's, how is that a bargain? I'll tell you why. I wound up getting it on eBay from some sort of shop that was a consignment shop, shop or something like that. The tag inside was a production costume tag, meaning it was one of the ones made for production. Um, it even says costume in there. And I wound up getting it really inexpensive, like, like, like more than 50% off what the non-production one would have been. So the worth of it is really high because of what it is, but the cost of it was a bargain. So there's my bargain. Uh, do you have some general tips for dressing in the Bond style? Yes. Go to uh, YouTube, go to the Bond experience, start on video one, press play, um, get a drink and a diaper you're going to need it. No, I, that, was, uh, that was glib. You know, my, my tip is, first of all, going back to one of the questions, don't wear anything that you wouldn't wear. You know, you're not Bond, I'm not Bond, nobody's Bond, we're not killing people, we're not misogynistic too much. But wear something you're comfortable with, but get something that fits. Don't get something that's oversized. Try on different sizes. You might be surprised. You thought you were an extra large, and you're a large. That's my Hack Your Life tip. Uh, attitudes or general rules. Yeah, attitude is own the outfit. <laughs> Whatever you're going to wear. If it's toweling, you know, Ian Fleming top like this one, own it. Uh, don't go out there all gun shy and, you know, just own it. Own the moment and be proud of it and don't try to hide it. Uh, just, gosh, you're an adult. Be happy with yourself. And knowing's half the battle. Any particular items we should all try to have, like black trousers, black turtleneck, for those sneaking around factories at night. That's funny. I do like that. Yes, have an all-black outfit with black gloves and a black... No, don't do that. That's, uh, that's very bad. I, I would say that there are some basics in any man's wardrobe. I think if you're going to have any suit, it should be a navy suit. I think you need to have uh, gray slacks, gray pants, trousers, whatever you want to call them. I think a good crisp white shirt. Uh, a good blue dress down uh, dress shirt, uh, three different colored polos, um, maybe dark navy and you know two other colors. Um, good shoes, again brown and black. I mean you know the basics. I think if you're watching this, you probably do know the basics. Uh, I will say this though: if you're if you're looking to shop for yourself and you have a certain amount of money to spend on something that's of quality, go for shoes. Go for shoes every time. Shoots. Uh, shoes and I think suits, but shoes, good, good shoes. Uh, they cost a lot, but it makes a difference. Watches too, by the way. Oh, that's not true. There are some really good and expensive watches. Uh, the Urban Gentry has taught me that. What has been your best or favorite Bond experience to date? Oh, <laughs> you know, I would say that my best Bond experience to date, I've got to say this, has been... Um, my 50th birthday because a bunch of uh, my Bond friends flew in, uh, some of them from overseas, and uh, just surprised me with kind of like a Bond party with Bond gifts. And it was just amazing. And it was a total surprise. And my wife was in on it, but kept it a secret. It was just amazing. And getting, you know, I do these Bond community interviews and I do them for a reason because I love getting together with people in the Bond community. It is my favorite thing by far. It's better than any package getting. It's better than getting going to any store. It's better than watching the movie. 
it's connecting with other people. So that had to be one of my favorite bond experiences. It's clear to see how your vlogs have developed and improved over the years. That's because of other people. You even have fancy graphics and a microphone now. That's because of other people. Did you ever envision that you'd still be going from strength to strength years later, even doing shared and live vlogs? Do you have any plans for future development or you just go with the flow? I, so I always hope that I would keep doing this as a hobby. Um, it's really, I'm, I'm extremely grateful and humbled and honored that anybody, um, anybody besides my mother would want to watch these. And I'm really, it's so gratifying to meet people who have seen it and have said that it's influenced them, whether it's the Bond health uh, things, the fitness, the clothing, just the fun things. I mean, I like to, I like to add enthusiasm and fun to my videos because I think we need more of that, not less of that. Just call me crazy. So I'm so grateful of that, but I didn't I didn't envision that it would be this. So this is this has been great and the ride's going good. And uh, am I going with the flow? No, I'm always trying to um, I'm always trying to do things differently. And and I actually run my I run the Bond experience almost like I would imagine somebody would run a studio, and it's probably because of what I do for a living. But, you know, I think about preheating certain videos with Instagram and YouTube. I'm starting to dedicate YouTube more to other influencers in the community and showing their videos. So I'm trying to share more and collaborate. So what I'm trying to do, my, my future vision is that it's not these silos of that guy and that girl and that guy and that guy and that video and that blog. But instead, it's more crossovers, more people connecting, more collaboration, more sharing. Uh, I'm, th that's, that's my vision, but it's not a Bond experience vision. It's just a, it's a Bond community vision. Do you feel there's been a coming up together of Bond clothing fans, especially with the current spate of people getting involved and trying to get companies to reproduce original screen accurate clothing? Do you think you are at the forefront of this and do you have any screen accurate items you'd like to see remade? That's a lot in there. Um, so I would say probably around Quantum of Solace, especially the Bond clothing, what I call Bond lifestylers, Bond lifestylers, people that like to live like Bond one moment at a time, through clothing and accessories and, you know, they really started to become very profound and loud and great in numbers. Now it's deafening. And you've got people in their teens. You've got people in their 80s and 90s who correspond with me who are doing the Bond clothing and, and they don't need to get, you know, this brand. They can go to any place, you know, Walmart, they can go to Highmart, they can go to any of these types of brands and capture that Bond look in essence, which is more here than it is here. So I think it's it's an easier group to grow. In fact, there's, there's a question. I'm going to read the next question. Props have taken a backseat over the last few years. Do you think this is due to the props are commercially available or not commercially available um, and, and the customer base is not as excited? Uh, especially as I think some prop makers on fan boards make far superior items than the actual one. So a couple things in there. The reason I brought that up in that question is I do believe that props are not as prevalent for a few reasons. And I'll talk about this because I know to many people I'm, you know, enemy, public enemy number one with props, but I love props. I, I've actually invested and been a part of most fan prop projects and I have every licensed prop there is, except for the uh, SD Studios briefcase. So I'm a big believer in props. And then I have tons of others. I mean, seriously, my collection is surrounded. I have more props than I have clothing. People don't realize that. But I am the clothing guy. I'm the accessory guy. I'm the lifestyle guy. And I get that. So what, what I think has happened is a couple things. First of all, it's much easier for somebody to go to a store down the street and get a blue polo and chinos and go, I'm a part of the Bond community of Bond lifestylers and clothing people. It's easy. It's accessible. You have a lot more advertising of these brands because they're fashion brands and they can afford it. You know, Factory Entertainment and some of these other companies or the private prop makers who are amazing. They really can't advertise and get to that wide audience. So they can do something on a forum, but it's a limited edition of 10 or 12. So now you've got 10 or 12 of those out there. So with clothing, it is so much easier to gravitate to that. You have giant companies behind it. The other thing is you've got people like me. You've got people like Matt Spazer. You've got Peter Brooker. You've got, you know, so many different individuals that 
talk and have a megaphone held up to the Bond community talking about living the life. And so we're everywhere. We're everywhere. Hashtag uh, Bond Complex. Sorry about that. I know I've got to pay them a dollar every time I say that. James Bond Complex. But the other thing, and this is the third thing, and I promise it's the last one with this, you know, props and wardrobe, is I think what happens is from a, from a sharing standpoint, it's sometimes easier to show up to something in Bond clothing because it's an invisible hobby. You can take it to work with you. You can wear it to a function. You could wear it to a picnic. Taking my golden gun to a picnic may alarm people. I don't know. It might, though. So it's, it's these things that I think parlay, but I really hope more people do uh, prop projects, whether they do be fan-based, which are fantastic, to uh, some of the licensed ones. I, I really hope they get those cooking, and we'll see. All right, and the last question, for those of you not asleep, or I don't know who's still watching, but if you're watching, you're a saint. You're a saint. Can you get me a cheapish Billy Reed Bond point peacoat? Yes, I can. And I know who you are. Um, so contact me. So anyway, um, first of all, thank you again for Barbell and um, everybody from AJB for allowing me to, to play in your world constantly, um, allowing me to be in those forums and for asking me these great questions. I will post this, I'll post the link. And um, for those of you that survived this, thanks. You have my condolences. Anyway, this has been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience, and we will see you very soon. Take care.